how did this fish get to be a fossil? Well, just dying doesn't make it. It got buried very rapidly, right? Can you think of an event in history associated with burying billions of creatures rapidly in unimaginable amounts of sediment? The flood. But remember, the time of the flood, lots of things got buried rapidly, right? Now, when you dig up a fossil, are you digging up the past or the present? Okay, there seems to be a difference of opinion. Let's just do it this way. How many people say when you dig up a fossil, you've dug up the past? Hands up. Okay, hands down. How many people say when you dig up a fossil, you've dug up the present? Hands down. How many people didn't vote? <laughs> Hands down. Okay. How many people in this room exist in the present? Hey, that's about half. That's excellent. <laughs> no, the reason I say that, in my experience, the percentage tends to be much higher on the weekends and much lower on the weekdays. So 50% on a Friday, that's outstanding. And you can laugh if you want to, but I asked this question in California about a year ago. It was 5% tops. Those folks didn't know if they were there or not. It was really kind of frightening. I don't know. What it, when you dig up a fossil, you've dug up the present. You cannot dig up the past. The past is what? It's gone. That's why they call it the past. The best you can do is have whatever specimen, sample, or piece of evidence to examine in the present. So for the sake of this discussion, we're going to say, you know, you're digging a barbecue pit in the backyard or something, and you dig this up. I want you to tell me what you know about this. Not what you wish, not what you hope, not what might be, not what could be, not what you heard on the National Geographic channel. I want you to tell me what you know about that. It's dead. And what else do you know about it? It's a fish. That's a dead fish. At the end of the day, that's really all you know about this. Question, what color was that fish before it got dead? You don't have any idea. Question, what'd that fish eat? And fish food is not an acceptable answer, by the way. In this case, you don't know, do you? Now, to be fair, we do have some fossil specimens that, you know, when they dug them up, they have like, found like parts of other creatures in their tummy, things like that. So in certain cases, we do know what at least part of the diet was. In this case, you don't have any idea. Question, was that a smart fish or a dumb fish? Some people say it's a dumb fish or it wouldn't be a fossil. I totally get that. But at the time of the flood, there would have been enough sediment. Even the smart creatures would have gotten buried rapidly, right? Question, where did that fish die? What physical location on the surface of the earth did that fish die? All you know is where it ended up. There are places around the world, we call them fossil graveyards. They're just acres and acres and acres and acres. And there's like billions and billions and billions of fossils. All these creatures get together and commit suicide? How'd that work? No, they got trapped in the sediment flow and they got, you know, deposited in an area. All you know is where it ended up. Hey, do fossils come with labels? Hi, I'm 65 million years old. My point is this. We need to separate what we know from what we assume. Which is why it really surprises people when they, when they make their first visit here to the Creation Museum and they actually start the museum tour. You know, we call it the walk through history upstairs in front of the special effects theater. We've got the area where you go down the hallway. The first exhibit you come to really surprises most people. And I've had lots of people comment to me about this over the years because they expect to find themselves in a Bible place. You know, day one of creation or the Garden of Eden. The very first exhibit is the dig site. And to me, this is one of the most important exhibits in the entire museum. We've got two scientists here, and they're both digging up a dinosaur fossil. One of these scientists is a creationist, the other one's an evolutionist. And on the screens behind this exhibit, behind this display, these two scientists are going to interpret their fossil find for you. fascinated by dinosaurs, watching movies, collecting models, reading all about them. Dinosaurs were big, 
They were magnificent. They were awesome. I was taught that dinosaurs once ruled the world, but that millions of years ago, they disappeared from the Earth. Everything I believed about the age of the Earth, the cycles of life and death, the evolution of humankind began dinosaurs. And then I learned that the Bible presented a very different history. Kim here is my colleague, fellow paleontologist. We've been friends since college. Today we study the same fossils, we use the same techniques, but that doesn't mean we agree on what happened here. We do interpret our findings differently. You see, fossils don't come with tags on them, telling us how old they are, where they lived, what they ate, or even how they died. We have to figure that out from the clues that we find. We never have enough clues. So, our starting points usually lead us to different conclusions. Here's how I see it. I think this dinosaur died over 100 million years ago. It dried out in the sun for a long time. Um, and later, I think the specimen was uh, covered by river sediment, uh, which was caused by a local flood. She's been lying here all this time till we dug her up. Where Kim sees millions of years, I see evidence of a different history. I believe this animal died in a flood, but it wasn't a local flood. It was a massive flood that covered the earth, Noah's flood, when God judged the world. The carcass was buried suddenly before it could be eaten or decomposed, buried in a layer of sediment that stretches across the entire continent. Since the flood, according to the Bible, was about 4,300 years ago, that's how old I believe this fossil to be. We come to different conclusions because of our different starting points. I start with the Bible, my colleague does not. We all have the same facts. We merely interpret the facts differently because of our different starting points. And why this is such an important exhibit is this. As I travel all over the world and talk to people and try to answer questions and engage them about the authority of Scripture, or I talk to our museum guests or people that come to the Ark Encounter, it is very common that somebody will approach me and say, well, Tommy, you people in Answers in Genesis, you deal with this creation evolution stuff all the time. You know, you're sort of on the cutting edge of all this business. You know, I've got a friend who's an evolutionist. Give me the latest and greatest. Give me the very best evidence I can use to show my friend or family member or whoever, you know, that evolution evolution's not true. Is that the way this works? Folks, that's not the way this works at all. Here we have two scientists looking at the same physical evidence. They come to two totally different conclusions. One scientist says this fossil is 100 million years old. The other scientist says it's 4,300 years old. How can that be? They're looking at the same evidence. Simply this, folks, this whole creation evolution discussion, this whole debate, if you will, is not a battle of evidence. It's not about finches and fossils and rock layers. It's about how you interpret the finches, the fossils, and the rock layers. Two scientists looking at the same specimen come to totally different conclusions. How can that be? It's not about the evidence. It's about the worldview you bring to interpret the evidence. 